How's it going YouTube? My name is LVN and we are back with another Smite God Guide. Today we're looking at Merlin. He's a mage. He's very fun to play. He's actually my favorite mage to play. Um, and some people think he's the hardest mage to play and some people think he's the easiest mage to play. I'm going to try to break him down and make him the easiest mage to play for you guys. Um, you guys have shown a lot of love to this channel. I kind of just threw up two guides that my friends wanted to see on this channel. Not really thinking that there'd be much growth, but you guys are actually subscribing and liking the videos and commenting uh, your suggestions. So thank you guys so much for all the support. So let's go ahead and dive into it. So Merlin, what makes him fun and separates him from other mages is that he is actually a stance changer so if you if you'll see here you have a fire stance a void stance and a frost stance so he has different abilities depending on which stance you're in and he can change between those stances by pressing his ultimate and then you can select which stance to go in from there but let's try to break it down one stance at a time and let's start off by looking at your void stance now due to the or based on this guide this is going to be the stance that you're going to kind of hang out in it is your ranged stance stance and your safest stance to be in. Uh, so how it works is your three will always be flicker regardless of what stance you're in. This shares a cooldown depending on whichever stance you're in. So if I am in void stance and I flicker and then I transfer into ice stance for example, then this will still be on cooldown. Now your other two spells do change depending on what stance you're in. So let's go ahead and take a look at the void stance and what makes it the safest and ranged one. So your one is you throw out this little vortex, and as it goes out, it expands. Now, it is a, a smaller purple circle, but what makes it so good is that if it hits a god, it'll make a bigger ring around it. So let's hit one of the Odins as it expands out. And you see this even bigger circle around the smaller purple circle. Now, what how it works is if that smaller purple circle hits a god, it'll mark them. So if it hits a god as it goes out, it'll mark that god, and then if they stay inside the bigger circle, it'll just deal ticking damage to them. Now, that is good in it to know, but at the baseline, you're just going to want to hit gods with it. You just want to shoot it at gods and hit them with it. Now, one way to confirm that ability is your two. So there is some, some interplay between these two abilities and some synergies. What the two does is you put down a circle, and after about a second, it'll yoink everyone into the middle. So... We're gonna use the two and it pulls them into the middle. So you can imagine how if I were to put the two down and then shoot the one through it, it creates a little combo or a little synergy. So um, if I put my two down, it'll yoink them in and I can go ahead and shoot the one right through the center of that. And that is your bread and butter ability with this void stance. So if we put the two down and then shoot the one through it, and then they're both gonna stay in that ring and take damage, they'll take the initial big chunk of damage from the purple line going out. So that's the void stance. And um, you can see how that is your ranged stance. So now let's work into our melee stance or our more risky stance, and that is your fire stance. So as you see, I just pressed my ultimate and I changed into the next ability. Now you can manipulate which uh, stance you change into. So right there, all I did was press four or my ultimate ability button and it just moved me to the next one in the order. So from void to fire to ice. But if I wanted to go from void to ice, I would press four and then press three. So it'll take me to the third one. If I'm in ice and I want to go to fire, I would press four and then press two to tra transfer into fire. So that's how the changing into stances works. But let's look at fire. So fire, like I said, is the riskier or melee one. So if you wanted to clear a wave, so say that this is the minion wave, you would have to get up close and personal. So why? Why would you have to do that? Well, your one is you just become a fire hydrant. You just start, or a hydrant of fire, I should say. You just spew out fire from your hand. And it does ticking damage, and the special thing about the fire stance is you leave a little dot on them. So it's it does have the highest damage output, it has the highest ceiling of damage because of that extra dot. But like I said earlier, it is risky. So that is your, your one, you just do a line of, of, of a fire ability right from yourself and it does a lot of damage ticking. And then your two is you, you spawn these two cones that both aim at each other. So if, if someone is in between both cones, they'll take the damage from both of them at the same time. So how it looks is like this. So I'll put it right here on this Odin. It will be in the center. Actually, I'll do it on this one because it might hit, it might be a little wider than I'm thinking. But so how it works is 
you see this Odin is taking the damage from both of them because it's in that little center part, but then these Odins were in just one of the sides, so they take half the damage as that Odin. So your bread and butter ability, or your bread and butter combo for this stance is just like your void stance, you two and then one. So you two, put it down, and then you try to one the people in it and just try to wiggle around, try to make yourself harder to hit. Now, why I say this is the riskiest one is you don't want to hang out in this because if you hang out in this stance, then you're going to be putting yourself at risk whenever you clear a wave because your best wave clear, this two, the two does not, it's hard to hit all the minions, to hit the archers and the, the bruiser minions up front. So you're going to have to hit with your one. You're going to have to step right up and hug this front minion and you put yourself at risk from the enemy mage clearing minions and then also just the assassin coming up behind you or something so you don't want to hang out in this stance but it is nice to know how to use the stance because this is kind of your most your highest kill potential stance so what how it's going to work i'll get into later down the road how you can kind of play between the stances but let's go ahead and really quickly get uh through our frost stance so this is our hybrid stance once again i just pressed four and it moved me to the next one over this is our hybrid stance. You can you can play it as a range stance or it can be very good as a melee stance if you need it to be. So why I say that is because you have this blizzard ability, which uh, this is your two. I'll go over your two first. And you, you summon just a circle and it'll just rain down ice and slow people inside of it and, and do damage. So that is your two. And how it works is your one will actually do bonus damage if the enemy is slowed. Now this works for any slow. So if you have a Sun Wukong and they use their two and spin around someone and you shoot your frost bolt at them, it'll do bonus damage. But there is once again, some interplay between using your two and then your one first in this stance as well. So if we drop the two, our frost bolt, we just shoot a little snowball at someone. So boom, and it'll do extra damage if they're slowed. So if we two and then one, it, it does a lot of damage. Now, notice how your one is on a very low cooldown. So that's why I say this stance is a good hybrid build because uh, your two has a longer cooldown. And as you can imagine, people can just move out of it very easily. There's no way to lock them down inside of it. But your one has such a low cooldown and it's it can be used from afar that it's also good at range. Now, this stance, I'll get into it once again, but it's very good for self-peeling because if someone jumps on you, say that this Odin jumps on you, then you can drop the two at your feet and then hit them and then blink away and they are slowed. Um, they're going to be stuck in that damage unless they can jump again or blink again somehow. But it's just very good in, in melee to get away. But it just it's it's not as easily confirmable damage as the fire or void stance since the void stance you can set yourself up to get that big burst of damage from your one. And then your fire stance just does a lot of damage. That's all it's meant to do. Uh, this stance is a good hybrid, but I personally think it's best to just stay in void stance until you have some kill potential and then go into fire stance so that's the three stances and let's go ahead and start getting getting into the build so what items can you build well that is where you can kind of open up to a lot of creativity with merlin so he builds a lot of items very good you could go for a little bit more cooldown early on but the best start for him is to actually go conduit gem since this will allow your one and two to full clear waves at level two and it just gives good poke damage as well to gods but then you're going to want to go into a uh, chronos pendant because these two items work very well together they give you a lot of mp5 so that you can stay in lane and they let you recycle your abilities more often now also note that this passive ticking away at your cooldowns works on your ultimate. So not only are you cycling between your one and your two in whatever stance you're in, but you're also able to swap between stances more often with this item. And then from there, you're gonna wanna go a little bit more damage. Now he does very well since he has so many abilities between all of his stances. He does build Soul Reaver well. He definitely builds Soul Reaver well. He also builds Soul Gem pretty well, which he's one of the only mages that you could make it work. But the best route to go with him is Spear of Desolation. He is the absolute, hands down, best god in the game with Spear of Desolation. Let me go ahead and talk to you a little bit about why. Well, let's actually go this way. So Spear of Desolation, if you get a kill on a god or an assist on a god, you subtract two seconds from all of your cooldowns. This includes your ultimate. 
So how he usually plays his bread and butter combo is you're going to be in void stance because that's where you kind of just permanently stay. You're going to shoot your one, use your two, or use your two and shoot your one. And then you're going to transfer into your fire stance for the kill potential and try to melt them away that way. Now, the reason why Spear of Deso is so good is because not only will you get the kill in your fire stance and kind of take some seconds off of the cooldowns of that stance, but you're also going to be able to transition out of fire stance even quicker now you can imagine if you get multiple kills like this you're going to be able to just uh you're going to be able to void stance use your two and your one and then transfer into fire stance use your two and then your one and then if you get multiple kills you'll have your your ult already available to use and you can transfer back into void stance or back into ice stance even and use the two and the one that way so it just allows for so much play that it's just such a good item that you have to go Spear of Deso on Merlin. So we're going to use our two, use our one. We're going to transition into Fire Stance, and we're going to get the kill. And then, as you see, it's only one kill. But let me go ahead and kill this raw. But it takes seconds off of our ultimate. And if we get two kills, then we can go ahead and transfer back into Void Stance. Oh, come on, raw. Don't kill me. No, he killed me. But as you can see, if you get those kills, get those resets, which is what you're aiming to do. Obviously, you want to play around uh, what the goal is, and that is to get kills. Oh, sweet. I killed him. Um, and that is, it's just such a good item for allowing you to do that because it allows you to swap back and forth between different uh, stances. So his bread and butter combo, like I said, is to use his void one and then two and then go into fire stance and one. Now, you're going to be in uh, some scenarios. All right, after Spear of Deso, which I think that this, this start of three items is just very strong, you can kind of branch out into any of the items that I just listed below. Um, so you can go Soul Gem if you want those procs. You want a little bit of lifesteal, a little bit of sustainability. But you could also go Ethereal Staff for that same reason, a little bit more health, become a little bit more tankier, easier, or harder to dive. You're really good at applying these procs. Or if you have a lot of healing on the enemy team, you can go Divine Ruin. He is one of the best mages to apply Divine Ruin because, like I said, he has a lot of abilities, a lot of range to his abilities, and um, he also can use that proc of damage pretty well. So um, I would go Divine Ruin next is my easiest recommendation. And then from there, right now, currently, I would probably go Ethereal Staff since it's just such a strong item right now. And then from there, I would go Soul Reaver. Since you're going to be using a lot of abilities, especially with these resets, you'll get good value from that. And you just you, you, it just does a lot of damage. So this is my recommended build. Now, you could swap Divine Ruin and Spear of Desolation if you wanted to. If there's just so much healing on the enemy team that you're going to want that Divine Ruin for the 12-minute mark for that first beacon fight. But um, for, the, for the most part, this build will do you very well. Now, also, you could swap if you want that 40% cooldown and you want that lifesteal. Like I said, you could swap Ethereal Staff for Soul Gem, and this build works fine too. Now, Soul Gem is not really a meta item, but it's just so good on him. Since you're spewing out a lot of abilities, you get to that four uh, abilities right after each other really quickly. So it's just a good item to go. And then from here, I like going this uh, Archmage's Gem, but Gem of Focus is probably going to serve you a little bit better. Like I said, since you're spamming so many abilities, you're just going to have uh, full stacks of focus very easily. Um, so I would go Gem of Focus for the recommendation. Uh, if you wanted to have a little bit more fun, see those yellow numbers come up a little bit more often, you could finish the build with Archmage's Gem if you want, and if you want to play a little um, wet and wild. But um, let's go and look at some real applications of this god and how it would look. All right, so now we're going to look at some real life applications of how you're going to use Merlin um, in a real scenario. So I have my friend Knights here. Um, I'll let him do a little shout out really quick uh, in a second. But he's playing Odin, which Odin is just a good example of a god that's going to be diving you as a mage. So um, here is, is how it's going to look. You're going to be in your void stance to start because that's kind of your like your home stance, it's what you stay in, it's what you clear waves in and start fights in. Um, and let's just show you what it's gonna look like when you get dove. So Dan, if you want, you can go ahead and uh, do your worst. Go ahead and jump on me, I'll, I'll act like I'm attacking your little, your mage friend. So, okay, so right there, that's like the main way that you're gonna be escaping from, from pushes and that's why void stance is so safe. So if you jump on me again, I'll show it again. But all you do is you drop the two at your feet and you dash away. And it either, either forces him to get out of the two 
or it'll force him to get sucked in and just create a little bit more distance than normal from yourself. And then let me swap to the ice stance, Dan, and then you can try it again. Um, and I'll show how this one works too. So this is your other kind of home stance, what you're gonna stay in for the most part. So go ahead and do your worst. Look, I'm a weak little mage. So you're gonna drop the two, walk away. It's like Napoleon Dynamite, you know, like when he's like, break the wrist, walk away, break the wrist, walk away. That's the same thing. You, you drop the two to slow him at your feet, you run away. So that's kind of how you get out of these situations. But uh, let me swap stance and then let, let's get this cooldown back. But I'll show you kind of how you can turn and burn. How you can uh, do the same thing, but if you're also looking to kill that person, if you have maybe your ADC with you to, to help fight them. But this is just if, if you have no way to kind of escape to your tanks and to your support, then this is how you turn and burn. All right, Dan, T your time's up. Do your worst. So you do the same thing. And then you can kind of come back in and, and get a little damage off and you do so much damage with your fire. Look at him running away. See, so you, so that's that's kind of what you do if you're getting dove. All right, so another real world application of this Merlin play style is um, we're gonna look at me versus Fenrir. So I have knights here again. Um, knights, if you wanna do a little quick shout out. All right, he does it. <laughs> okay, so so he's gonna jump on me and try to kill me as like, what, what did you build, like full damage? Yeah, it's just full damage. Okay, so like he's like just your typical jungler, especially Fenrir being so popular right now. And I'll just, I'll, I'll do my thing and you jump on me and you kill me. And I'll kind of use my little, I'll try my best to get away. All right. Go crazy, do your worst. And he has his passive stack too. Yeah. <laughs> so as you see, I mean, you can just create so much distance between yourself and people diving you just because you're too on your, your void stance and just your turn and burn potential is so high. Being in void stance and swapping to fire stance, you just, you, you just get so much damage off like that. Okay, so the last thing that I'm going to show you guys is the start on a conquest map because it's a little weird and a little counterintuitive. So the first question you have to ask yourself is what are you going to pick as your home stance? Like what stance do you want to clear the first wave in? And depending on what you choose, if you choose ice stance, you're going to go your two first. And if you choose void stance like I do, you're going to go your one first. Now, oh, the reason why you do that, I'll show you guys in just a second, but we're going to pick our first ability and we're going to swap to fire stance. That's the step one is pick your first ability based on your home stance and then swap to fire stance. So then... You're just gonna do your normal build and run out to, let's see, where do we go? And then you're gonna go the Horn Shard. Like I said, with with Kronos Pendant and Spear of Deso, those uh, static resets, those resets by a certain amount of time are very good, so that's why Horn Shard kinda goes well with this build that we've chosen. So you start off in Fire Stance because like I said, it gives you your highest damage potential. So it gives you better clear at level one, but starting off out of your home stance allows you to swap into your home stance um, and just get the, be, be in that safer stance for the wave clear. So we're dragging it to, and, and like I said, the reason you're gonna start out of your home stance is so that you can swap to your home stance and do more damage. So you see, we swap to our home stance and now it allows us to go in it allows us to clear faster by having two abilities there, um, but coming into it, well, our Arachne bot <laughs> didn't come to red buff it. You clear red, and you would come into lane in your void stance, in your safer stance, or if you chose ice stance, that works too. And then from here, you can clear the wave very easily with Conduit Gem. You see it full clears archers. We actually killed the bot, which is nice, and... <laughs> Dude, these bots are so stupid. Okay, so that's that's how you start a game of conquest. Now, if you started with your two, you would choose ice stance as your home stance because your blizzard is your better clear than your frost build. Uh, all right, so the last two things about his kit that I'm going to talk to you guys about are his ultimate and his passive. So his ultimate at the baseline, before you put any points into it, you do get it. So you get it at level zero and level one. But it, does, it doesn't do any damage. It just allows you to swap between stances. But where it gets interesting is once you are able to put a point into it. So as you see, I'm level five. I've put one point into my four. So how it works is once you have it doing damage, uh, depending on which stance you are swapping from, 
and into, it'll gain d different effects. So you'll do one pulse of damage around you right as you press the button, and then after you've selected which stance to choose in, and once you swap into that stance, you'll pulse out damage and do an extra effect depending on which stance you choose. So now I'm in Void Stance, which the Void Stance adds a knockup to your ult. The fire stance adds a little ticking damage to the ult, to the extra pulse of damage that you do. And then the ice stance adds a 20% slow to the to the pulse that you do. So I am in I'm in arcane stance and I will swap to fire stance. So I'll, that first pulse will do a knock up and then the second pulse after I've swapped into fire stance will do a bit of ticking damage. So let's go ahead and see that. So pressing it, knock up and then the second pulse after we swap does that little bit of ticking damage let's do it again let's swap from fire to ice so we're going to do a little bit of ticking damage and then we're going to slow so and there they are if they're slowed you see the ice around their feet so it's a really cool ability and adds a lot of uh, additional bonus counterplaying that you can do so if you're getting dove you can slow them and knock them up going from ice to void so we're slowing them we knock them up and we can get away they're slowed they're knocked up, so it's just a little bit more CC that we have in our kit. Now our passive is also really cool and adds a lot of room to grow in terms of becoming a better Merlin player. So what it does is it adds basically a little Polynomicon, a mini version of Polynomicon to every single ability. So now whatever ability we press, we're getting a little bit of bonus damage if we auto between them. So it adds uh, bonus potential for Merlin as long as we're weaving up uh, autos between every couple of abilities or every ability if we can get away with it. So as you see, I'm doing 28 damage per auto. And then I summon that and, oh, I shouldn't have used my one. I should use my two. So 28 damage and then we use our two and 28 plus 12. So as you see, we get a lot more damage. So let's go ahead and do our whole kit and see how much bonus damage we can get into. So we use our one, auto. We two, auto. We ult, auto, we two, auto, and then we one, auto. And then let's go ahead and flicker, auto, because flicker also procs it. So it adds a lot more bonus damage potential, especially once we start getting more power in our build. That auto also will scale up in, in damage. But uh, you don't want to do this between every single ability because there are some time-sensitive cases. So like our two and our one and our void stance, we don't want to auto between those because we want to use them as quickly in succession as possible so that our two will pull them and our one will hit them. Um, but as you see in like our fire stance, there's a lot of damage potential. So if we swap to fire and then we use our two and then our auto and then one, there is some time to do that because then we can just chase them down while wanting. So if they start to run away from us, we can just chase them down. But we get that auto in right after we press our two. So there's a lot of extra damage potential in his kit and his ultimate and his passive. All right, that's going to do it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed this Merlin guide and give him a shot. He's a ton of fun. One of my favorite mages to play. And if you like this style of video, make sure and let me know down below. Let me know if you like having my friend come and join and help me with the video. And if I explained it well, let me know that as well. Um, if there's any improvements that you guys can see in this channel, also let me know because I am very open to comments and, and criticism. Um, but I really appreciate the support that you guys have shown me so far on, my, on the start of this Smite YouTube video journey. Um, I look forward to making a lot more videos for you guys. Uh, make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss any of them. Hit like if you like this video and comment down below anything that you guys want to tell me uh, because I am very open to suggestions and which gods you guys want to see next. That's going to do it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.